Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, recording notices. There we go. All right. I figured I would start since I don't live in Regina. I'm living in Winnipeg still because of COVID. I've been doing things remote, so I haven't been around. So I figured I would start with an introduction about me. I also give you my favorite summary that somebody used to describe me once, um, which is that nothing's happening. Here we go. There we go. So I'm a bird specialist with a fish infatuation. Uh, so this pretty much means that I have figured out a way to make my birding hobby into a profession. But if I'm not casually watching birds, professionally watching them, I am usually on the water with a rod, ice fishing, all of it. So, yeah, so I said I'm from Winnipeg. Go Jets, go playoffs tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and that is also where I got my, I did my undergrad. So I did my undergrad at the University of Manitoba, which is where I fell in love with birds. And I did an honors research project there looking at the overwintering habitat of purple martins. That's kind of where I got involved in research uh, and discovered how cool birds were. Uh, and then after that, I came to my senses and came over to the grassland world. Uh, so I took a job down in North Dakota. I ended up going back for three seasons, two in North Dakota, one in Montana, uh, studying grassland birds. We did everything from um, nest survival, uh, habitat use, uh, migration. We did like we did it all adult survival, and it was just cool working with all these amazing, unique grassland species that I lived in the prairies my whole life and had no idea about. Um, so, yeah. And then after that, I liked the grasslands so much that I found a project <laughs> that was studying grassland birds out of the University of Regina. So I came here, and I am now at the U of R but from Winnipeg, um, and I'm under Steve Davis with uh, Canadian Wildlife Services and Mark Brigham, which is the bat guy. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're both hiding in the back. Um, so before I get into some of my research, I wanted to see how many people would kind of consider themselves birders in the crowd. Okay, so there's a few of you, perfect, so I got a quiz. <laughs> Um, so I have some birds. We're just going to see who's familiar with what um, here. All right. So first one, I got an easy one. Mm -hmm. Yep, Perfect. All right. So I've got a fun fact for them all, too. Um, so males will actually mate with more than one female in a season. So they set up a territory and multiple females will nest in that same territory. So it's kind of their polygamous there. Um, Next one, We're getting a little trickier. Pardon? Yep, play colored sparrow. Perfect. These ones are cool. They estimate that 85% of them nest in Canada. So it's kind of neat. They're pretty abundant, but most of them are in Canada. Um, how about this one? Yep, here are a few Spanish sparrows. Um, another one, it is one of the most numerous songbird in North America. Um, they are still declining, but they're still one of the most savannah sparrow. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Getting a little figure. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, little brown bird. <laughs> yep. Yeah, another sparrow. We yeah, get more specific. <laughs> yeah. Birds. Yeah. We got birds over here. So this one is, they're pretty secretive. You don't see them up on the grass quite that often. Um, but this is actually the bear sparrows were the last new bird described by John Audubon. He first described it in 1843, and it was another 29 years before another one was reported. It's kind of cool. And not very far from here, they reported the first one in North Dakota. Um, this one, one of my personal favorites. Yep, grasshopper sparrow. We got an expert over here. <laughs> She's going to be out doing my presentation. <laughs> Um, so, uh, fun fact about grasshopper sparrows is that grasshoppers are their main, one of their primary diet food sources, but before they feed them to their young, they actually shake them super vigorously to rip the legs off. So they're a little bit aggressive. 
Um, they do have some attitude, um, which is one of the reasons I like them. Uh, and this is my last one, Sprague's Pivot. I'd say a lot of people have never seen them in this stage. You normally hear them yeah. flying mm -hmm. a few hundred meters above you. They will do aerial displays for 30 minutes at a time. Um, and they're one of the only species that does such lengthy aerial displays. And they've actually had one recorded doing it for three hours straight, straight before coming to the ground. So they're pretty impressive um, and pretty close to probably top favorite bird of mine. So they're a good one. Um, so these are all the birds that we just went through. We got the Western Meadowlark, Baird Sparrow, Grasshopper Sparrow, Sprague's Pippet, Clay Colored Sparrow, and the Savannah Sparrow. Can anyone, does anyone have any ideas about what all of these birds have in common? Grasslands, yeah, that's one major one. They're all grassland songbirds. Uh, they are found, you can find every single one of them in Saskatchewan. Um, and every single one of those species you can actually find at Last Mountain Lake. Um, so it's not very far. You don't have to go far to see them. You just have to pay attention because <laughs> they're very secretive. Um, yeah, they rely on grassland habitats, so open grassy areas, and they are well adapted to grazing uh, because they adapted to when the bison were free roaming on the prairies. Uh, so very specialized <coughs> birds. Another unfortunate thing they have in common is that they are all declining very steeply. Uh, so you can see here that grassland birds in Canada have declined 57% since the 1970s. So it's pretty extreme. Um, and some of the threats to the grassland birds, climate change is one. As we get more frequent and intense drought periods, the birds are having a harder time nesting. Uh, we've got changes to the natural disturbance regimes. So those are grazing and fire. So without the bison free roaming, obviously the grazing is not the same as it was. We, we replaced them with some cattle. And then we love to sequester fire, which was a natural process back when the bison were around. Um, and it created this nice mosaic grassland with different structures for different birds. Um, and then of course, habitat loss is another issue. Um, in Saskatchewan, it's estimated that there's only 14% of the native grasslands remaining. Um, and part of the habitat loss is high rates of land conversion and increased intensification of agriculture. So those are some leading causes of the declines of the grassland birds. <clears throat> yeah, we're gonna get to those ones. Um, so yeah, temperate grasslands are actually, no, people don't know, normally think of it, but they're actually considered the most threatened biome on the planet. So more so than your old growth forests. Um, they, because they're so highly valuable for agriculture, they experience extremely high um, rates of conversion for human land use, uh, which I think up here, this is the percentage of how much, how much of the, the whole percentage of the biome available in the world and 46% of it is being converted for human use. Um, and this is how much we protect, which is less than 5% of the entire biome. So you can see very high rates of conversion, low protection because they're so sought after for agriculture. Um, and there are, here's where we get to the non-native stuff, so a lot of grasslands um, have, are now composed of non-native vegetation too. Um, some of this was done intentionally uh, to promote cattle uh, production. Um, some of it was invaded from surrounding areas. Um, and then in some cases, we actually took old croplands and we converted them back to grasslands by planting non-native grasses. And it was a program to reduce soil erosion and improve soil quality in areas that were prone to drought. Um, so they tilled and seeded areas, planted non-native grasses, um, and now we've got a lot of non-native grass areas. 
um, which at this point, it's unclear if the planted grasslands are maintaining their attractiveness for birds over the entire breeding season. And so what I mean by that is, are the birds choosing to use it at the beginning and then staying on their territory and remaining there to breed? We know that yes, they go to it at the beginning when it's just a planted grassland, but they're also leaving earlier. But if we graze that, is there a chance that it will mimic what the native stuff looks like so that they stay for their entire breeding season and hopefully have some successful reproduction? Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, and that leads me to my project objective, which is determining the extent that grazed non-native grass cover will influence bird abundance across the breeding season. <laughs> so I'm looking at if we're grazing, are the birds going to stay on their territories and continue defending, continue nesting, the same as they would on the native grasslands. Um, so here, I'm just going to point out these pictures. This is a field of non-native in at Black Mountain Lake, and this is what we would consider native. So you can see the non-native that hasn't been grazed. It's very uniform, and the native might be a little tricky to see the color, but it's patchier, and you can see it's not one kind of uniform color and structure. Um, so to answer my question, I spent the entire summer last year at Last Mountain Lake camping at the regional park and doing bird counts. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with Last Mountain Lake, the national wildlife area, but it's like an hour and a half north up here. And if you've never been, it's very cool. And I'm just surprised how many people I've talked to in Regina that haven't been. <laughs> and I'm from Winnipeg and it's been, you know, have been a few times now. Uh, so what do we do? Bird surveys. Obviously, we can't study the birds if we're not counting them. So we did four rounds of point counts. So four rounds we did. Each round was 13 days. We did, and we did eight counts within those 13 days. So we had five days of buffer in case there was bad weather. So high winds and rain, we don't, snow, we had to deal with snow last year. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> in June. Um, we don't do counts. So we had to do eight days of counts, a 13 day period. At the end of the 13 day period, the second round started, we started all over. And it was basically snapshots of what the entire season, how it progressed uh, with the birds. Anyone who is not familiar with the point count, uh, this, is it? Basically, it's a standardized method of surveying birds. So we stand in one spot by ourselves and you count every bird that you see and hear from a specific location. Uh, these are the data sheets we, we were using. Makes it easy because you can write where the bird is seen. You don't have to, um, there's less information to write down. But we record if it was singing, if it was calling, approximately where we saw it, how far away it was. And it's a just a standardized five minute count and we do it, but well, we had several counts over the season. But that's kind of the gist of it. Oh, we're just starting that over again. Um, How many counts did we do? So we did the four rounds. I had 128 field sites and we did two counts per site. So we did 64 of them inside the National Wildlife Area and 64 outside, so that we could see if there's any differences between how the land is being managed. Um, and with two counts per site, we there was four of us. We did a whopping 1,024 counts over the summer. So we were very busy, um, a lot of early mornings, but obviously like our mornings were beautiful. <laughs> um, so it wasn't the worst, except for the days that there were frost. Those weren't the fun ones. Um, yeah, so we did it. I actually wrote down the dates here. So May 22nd was the first count, um, and we had snow just before that. And then June 3rd, June 3rd and 4th, we had frost, and then we counted until July 14th. So our last count was on July 14th. So it was to encompass the entire breeding season of the birds. Um, 
Then, of course, we're looking at habitat. So the next thing we had to do was the always fun vegetation surveys. And for those, we did four samples per point count per round. So if you are doing the math in your head, times the last number by four, we did four th almost 4,100 vegetation surveys. And the vegetation surveys, it's going to be a little bit hard to see, but there's 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. Put it on the ground, and we're looking at everything from the percent of bare ground, percent cover of cow pies. Um, we had live, estimating percent cover of live grass, dead grass. We, I, we were identifying grass to species to see if it was native or non-native and how much of it was in there. So we can get a general idea of what the birds are using and the overall structure of the areas. So these are a couple of my crew members looking very intensely at some grass, which was by the end of the season, you kind of go cross-eyed, but um, yeah. So at this point, obviously there's a lot of data. It's still being explored. Um, we're gonna go over kind of what some, some things that we've already found, um, just very preliminary results and some cool findings. At least I think they're cool. Um, okay, first one, when, once we uh, looked at the data, we actually realized that when we planned the sites, we planned an even split of native and tame. And then we looked at the data and realized that a lot of it was not native. So there's, we were not finding very much native. So only 15% of our sites are what we would consider native. Um, everything else has been either swapped to tame or it's just like mixed. So closer to like a 50, 50 split. And here's, here's a bigger photo of what a non-native versus what we consider native because obviously that structure is more native-like. Um, but onto the bird stuff. So got some interesting findings. This one's my favorite one. <laughs> but we found a pair of chestnut collared longspurs out at Last Mountain Lake. Um, so anyone who is familiar with the bird might know that you don't find them there. That's what they tell you. But I looked up the history. The last one recorded was that the, was it the stalwart nature something? Yeah, there was one recorded in 2020. <clears throat> and then before that, the next closest one there was one recorded in 2003. So we found, found I found a pair. It's very exciting. No one else thought it was exciting, <laughs> but I thought it was very exciting. <laughs> um, I cannot confirm that they nested. I have, I don't think they did, but I found them for the very first count and chestnut colored long spurs being a gregarious species that like to be in a group. My guess is they were the only two there and they just kind of got up and left. So we never found them in the following. And I did go back and check frequently, but they were singing. I've got videos of the male displaying and stuff. So that was one of my interesting finds for the season. When you're out there every day, all the time, you never know what you're going to find. Um, and then another interesting find was the grasshopper sparrows. So obviously being from Saskatchewan and I worked, or being from Manitoba, um, I didn't know what to expect here. Working down in North Dakota and Montana, grasshopper sparrows were everywhere. When I was coming up here, I was told, oh no, you won't find any grasshopper sparrows at Last Mountain Lake, really rare. 60% of our field sites had grasshopper sparrows. And it could be we had came out of a drought season into a really wet season, so it could be that. But there's also, for being honest, the average age of the birding community is a little higher Mark, do you want to tell us what species you discovered you could not hear this year? <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, so the grasshopper sparrow seems to be that frequency that is one of the first frequencies you lose when you lose your start losing hearing. So I can't confirm for sure, but they could just be underreported. Um, so if anyone wants to go out and like test it this summer, I won't be around, but I'd love to see if the grasshopper sparrows are still there or if it was just like a one-off year. But that was an exciting one because they are a top favorite bird of mine. So I was super excited to... Yeah, bird sparrows is usually the next one. 
Um, and then maybe not so interesting because it's not surprising, but Western meadowlarks were found at 100% of the sites. Savannah sparrows were at 99%, so it was everything but two sites. I know the exact two spot sites, <laughs> but they were because it was my counts. Um, but they were also the for the two species that were found, they had the highest average. So per count site, uh, we had the, the abundance of savannah sparrows and western meadowlarks was higher than the other species. So, and by higher, I mean like two and a half birds per count versus half to one kind of thing. So obviously the densities aren't insane out there, but they're around. Although we had some 11 count sites with metal arcs. They're kind of everywhere sometimes. Um, more else. And then into some of the more like nitty gritty stuff. We've done some preliminary uh, results at this point, and they're suggesting that the bird abundance, so if you remember my question, now that we've done all the interesting fun stuff, um, <clears throat> I'll remind you that I'm looking at how the birds are responding to native versus non-native grasslands when they're being grazed. So looking at it from a preliminary results, um, it suggests that the abundance of the birds is not actually strongly influenced by the non-native cover when grazed. So what does that mean? It means that there was not much of a difference between the bird abundance on the native sites and the non-native sites as the season progressed. So um, basically it could be suggesting that the grazed planted sites like non-native are reflecting the structure of what the native sites are. So I can't say it for sure yet because we're still crunching numbers. There's a lot of them to crunch, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything we're looking at was grazed. Yeah, yeah, grazed both of them just to compare. See how the structures did. So yeah, it seems the birds are not being choosy. They're staying on the site, both sites throughout the season. Um, and yeah, so hopefully uh, for the research that I'm doing, it, it will have some positive management implications for grassland birds. So we're hoping that this information can be used by grassland managers to make more informed decisions on how to manage grasslands to support the habitat for declining grassland birds. So as a last mountain, a lot of areas will mow, um, but it might be more beneficial to graze. That's kind of where we're going. So yeah, that's kind of the gist of what I've been doing. Um, obviously I've got some great funders, including your group, which was big help. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. So thanks everyone for coming and listening. Yeah. <laughs> and so many questions. <laughs>